The world stands divided about the war between Israel and Hamas. But there's nothing to be divided about, right? My side is right, is what we all believe. Like most of the Middle East conflicts, which side you end up on depends on who is telling the story. In today's video, we look at what is Gaza Strip, who is Hamas, and who are the people that you need on your side if this is ever going to get resolved. So let's get started. The result is announced by Assembly President Aranya. The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. In 1947, the UN passes a resolution that this stretch of land is divided between the Jews and Muslims. The green area goes to the Jews and becomes Israel. And the blue area goes to the Muslims and will be called Palestine. More than 75 years later, this is what the divide looks like. The area in green is significantly bigger than proposed. And here's the thing, the Palestinian area is further divided into two regions. This here is called West Bank. While further 70% of this land is Israel occupied, leaving the Palestinians with just 30% of the land. Meanwhile, this small little area all the way over here is called the Gaza Strip, home to about 2 million Palestinians, a place with a population density of London, which also doubles as an active war zone. The problems with the proposal by UN were quite clear from the get-go. If you want to learn more about the UN proposal, you can check out this video I made. The video was also an investigation into what is Zionism and the role of Britain in starting this never-ending conflict. Do check out the video after this one, the links will be in the description below. First reaction from the Jews was one of joy. Crowds gathered in the streets and greeted the birth of their state with traditional dances. When UN proposed a two-state solution, the Jews who had been without a state were thrilled. However, the Arabs saw this as an act of aggression and a form of colonization, so they rejected the proposal. Having accepted the proposal, Israel declared independence on May 14, 1948. And in response, the neighboring Arab states declared war against Israel. The Arab states claimed this war was waged in support of Palestinians. However, this conflict led to two major outcomes. First, the Arab states lost the war and Israel didn't stop at what was allotted to them, but instead they pushed as far as they could, maximizing their territorial gains. Secondly, a huge number of the Palestinians that were now absorbed by this newly formed Israel were forced from their homes. 531 villages and towns were burnt. The event is called a Nakba by the natives, which translates to a catastrophe in English. Haganah forces seek out every Arab, and barricades are set up to screen those who had not already fled the city. Everyone is searched. 700,000 Palestinians, which is about 85% of the total Palestinian population at the time, were banished and displaced. During the Nakba, a bit over 15,000 Palestinian men, women and children were killed a whole bunch of these Palestinian refugees ended up settling in this narrow strip of land that is now known as the Gaza Strip. And the rest of them moved towards this region on the west bank of River Jordan. Here's the thing, most of the Arab states and their media groups like to label it as a war waged to safeguard the Palestinian state and prevent the creation of Israel. However, when Egypt took over the Gaza Strip and Jordan took over West Bank, both the nations saw these new lands as theirs. Practically no steps were taken towards declaring the land Palestinian or setting up a governance system for militants. If the Arab media likes to portray themselves as the Messiah, Israeli and some of the Western media likes to portray Israel as a harassed nation surrounded by hostile neighbors. But this perspective overlooks several key historical events. For instance, during the 1948 war, a newly started nation, Israel, was able to defend itself against six Arab states. So they must be strong. Further, Israel chose to occupy and colonize as much of the land as they could. They didn't care much about peace. Or all the people, Israeli mobs raped and murdered and displaced during the Nakba. There are many times when Israel has been the aggressor. These are not the actions of a nation that is under threat and needs $3.8 billion every year from the American taxpayer, especially when there are millions of homeless people in America. It is crucial for the media to present a balanced view of this situation, acknowledging both the security concerns of Israel and the valid grievances of Palestinians that are under the Israeli occupation. Anyhow, back to the story. It was through this mass expulsion and war that Gaza Strip came to be. Now let's look at where did Hamas come from. 
on the 5th of June, 1967, Israel launched an all-out war against its Arab neighbors. After only six days of fighting, it achieved total victory, defeating the armies of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. In the 1967, Israel initiated a war against Palestinians and the Arab states, taking over Gaza Strip and West Bank and a whole bunch of land from the neighboring countries. They took over so much land that in six days, Israel was three times the size it was at the beginning of this war. Around this time of occupation is where you start seeing a huge spike in militant activity in occupied Palestine, especially at the hands of the group called Palestine Liberation Organization or PLO. This is an ITN news flash from the Olympic Village in Munich, where early this morning armed Palestinian guerrillas raided the sleeping quarters of the Israeli team. The gunmen shot dead two Israelis and are now holding 20 athletes and six officials as hostages. PLO believed in fighting for their rights both through political and armed resistance. Their armed resistance was not so much against the Israeli Defense Forces, but more towards civilians, which in my books is the definition of terrorism. You can't just call it guerrilla warfare if your target is the civilian folks, not the military. To undermine PLO and their political party Fateh, Israel wanted to prop up an opposition party. So Israel decided that they're going to allow a bunch of fringe Palestinian Islamist groups to operate within Gaza Strip starting in the late 1970s. Given the fact that Israel had full control over Gaza Strip, they could have taken measures to stop these groups in the early days. In the early days, these groups were providing social services and humanitarian aid to the Palestinian population. And they were gaining massive amounts of support and legitimacy among the people of Palestine. It was one of these groups that in 1987 started Hamas. From the day Hamas was created, it has opposed the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. It has also advocated for armed resistance and the establishment of an Islamic state. The plan to undermine Fatah and PLO was working, but Gaza was even more volatile and violent than it had ever been before. As things were getting out of control and the cost to administer Gaza Strip was increasing, it was decided that Israel would fully withdraw out of the Gaza Strip. After being under Israeli occupation from 1967 to 2005, Gaza Strip was finally free. In all of this, West Bank has its own issues and stuff. That's a different video altogether. However, this freedom in Gaza was short-lived. By the year 2006, Hamas was popular enough to win a majority in the Palestinian Legislative Assembly. This was a shock to everyone. And this victory was followed by a brief civil war between the Palestinian Authority or Fatah and Hamas ending with Hamas keeping control of Gaza Strip and the Palestinian Authority or Fatah in West Bank. Following the armed takeover of the Gaza Strip, both Israel and Egypt, the two countries that share border with Gaza Strip, imposed a blockade on the Gaza Strip, which has greatly restricted the movement of people and goods in and out of the area. Over the years, the Israeli government has beefed up the blockade many times. The Israelis try their best to monitor what goes in and out of the Strip. Despite all these restrictions, Hamas has been able to smuggle weapons and supplies for rockets. And the only people who are struggling through this are the common Palestinians because they are in what is referred to as the biggest open air prison. They can't move, they can't get jobs, they can't go anywhere. There's no way to really leave Gaza Strip. The one airstrip they had was bombed down by the Israelis. In all of this, Iran, which is all the way over here, has been supporting Hamas by providing them money, weapons, and training. Hamas has used these weapons to carry out acts of terror, and they justify these by calling them guerrilla warfare. Every year, there are at least two major escalations between Israel and Hamas, and every single time, Israel bombs the shit out of Gaza Strip, and it's the common Palestinians that are hit the worst. Ever since Hamas has taken over, there have been no elections there. Their rule on Gaza Strip has been totalitarian. Hamas doesn't care about the people of Gaza, just like the Israeli government. According to CNBC, more than 18,600 Palestinians in Gaza and occupied West Bank have been killed in conflicts with Israel since 2008. That compares with at least 1,500 killed on the Israeli side over the same period. All of this while Israel continues to take Palestinian land and their rights. It began Saturday morning with a massive rocket barrage from Gaza striking across Israel. 
When on October 7th, Hamas broke into Israel and killed close to 1200 Israelis and took a bunch of hostages, the military was very late responding to the situation. We have helicopters, we have tanks, we have everything. For the first couple of hours, it's like the, we, are, we had no army. Are the words of survivors. Where was the army? Where was the army? Many Israelis reported that there was no military for about eight hours. When the military finally got there, eight hours late, they were able to gain control over this area that Hamas has broken into. But that gave them plenty of time to take close to 240 hostages back to Gaza Strip. The question is, what the fuck was the government doing? Within hours, the Israeli government launched a full-scale invasion with the goal of eliminating Hamas and started bombing the Strip. Without any regard for regular Palestinians or the Israeli hostages who could die thanks to the bombing. People were asked to move to the south of the Strip, but even the south and the evacuation routes have been bombed by Israel. As all of these Palestinians, who are, I guess, the collateral according to the Israelis, are getting injured, they're ending up in hospitals which are further being targeted by the Israelis. Now, I get it. The Israeli government claims there are a bunch of tunnels and stuff underneath these hospitals that are very critical to their oppression. I get it. But there were ways around the situation. Israel could have allowed the hospitals to move their patients to Israeli hospitals. They could have set up a bunch of mobile hospitals close to the border. The Israeli goal to finish Hamas is unrealistic. You can only give birth to more terror by killing innocent people. Even if, let's assume, Hamas is somehow finished through Israeli attack that's ongoing right now, the death and destruction that they leave behind is the perfect breeding ground for a Hamas 2.0. Typically, at this point of a video, I conclude things by discussing some solutions to a given problem. But today, I just have a few questions for you, the viewer, something we all need to think about. People of Israel who live under the threat of Hamas. I agree, it is gut-wrenching to watch fellow Israelis being murdered for no fault of their own. It is very painful to watch the images and videos of October 7th as it unfolded. Here's the thing, you don't control Hamas and terrorist organizations across the border or anywhere in the world. But you all do control the government you have. You can always check the government's role in all of this. How come a bunch of terrorists were able to enter one of the securest fences between two countries? When Hamas attacked, the Israeli military took eight hours to respond. Isn't that weird? Why is your government spending so much of your tax money on the West Bank settlements and protecting those settlements by using the critical military infrastructure which needs to be at the border with Hamas? But the biggest question you all need to ask is whether the society you live in is just. And to see if there is some truth, maybe just a shred of truth, behind all of these accusations of war crimes and apartheid system and all these things that have been laid against Israel by numerous numerous organizations throughout the globe. These are the questions your government needs to answer. Till these are answered, you and your loved ones will always be under the threat. Your government may be able to address the ongoing issue by killing a bunch of Palestinians and Hamas, and maybe the nation of Israel can revenge the people they lost. But what can stop this from happening again? What is the solution? And the only solution to this problem is through outstanding acts of kindness from both sides, the Palestinians, Hamas, and Israeli government, and the protesters. We need to all look at what is the underlying issue. It is hatred from both sides for each other. And there are justifications people can find for hatred for each other, but hatred is what's killing everyone in that region. That's it for this video. It took me forever to work this one out because I just felt so deeply about this video. I'll see you in a week or two from now. Peace.